All right. So, hello, good morning, everybody. Um, this is our second Frontiers of STEM Learning webinar um, in our ongoing webinar series. We'll be doing these once a month. Uh, during summer reading time, you will notice that we will be doing lightning webinars, so a 10 to 15 minute conversation about a relevant topic or field so that you guys don't have to feel like you're uh, using a bunch of your time to participate in those. So those will be starting next month uh, through the summer. And then we will go back to our normal hour-long format um, at the end of August or in September. And all of our webinar recordings can be found on our community sites. Uh, you can find the links to those in, excuse me, in the newsletters we send out or just go to community.starnetlibraries.org and click on the webinar archive. Uh, so this, our second webinar, the topic is high-tech versus low-tech STEM programming. Um, our panelists today are myself, Annie, from the Space Science Institute, I think you all know me, uh, Kelly and Lacante, who's also here at SSI, and Ashley Kajiaka, um, who is from the Colorado State Library. Um, she will be doing our presentation today, and then the three of us uh, jointly will be doing the discussion towards the end. Um, so again, if you haven't already, please do test that your microphone system is working so you can participate in that discussion. You can do that by clicking the communicate button at the top of your screen. And with that, I am going to go ahead and pass the torch on to Ashley and we can get started. Thanks so much, I appreciate the uh, intro. Absolutely, and I am passing you the presenter ball so you can control your own slides. Cool, <laughs> thank you. And I'm turning on my video momentarily. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, so um, my name is Ashley. I'm with the Colorado State Library. Uh, I do a lot of maker training and also STEMI stuff uh, here for librarians, both public side and school facing. Um, and while we're going along, if anybody has anything they wanna chime in on, ask me questions, feel free to do that in the chat as we're going and I will be watching it um, and can respond. So uh, we're gonna do, a, oh, we, we already introduced ourselves, but here's what we look like. You'll see the little video icon of us at the, on the side, but you know, just in case. Um, so I wanna do a quick sort of historical overview, mostly because this is my favorite story of all time and one of the greatest things that I found researching, um, which by the by, this is from an article in um, American Library. So if anybody wants the uh, citation for it, I'm happy to grab it and pass it on. Um, but, so you can use this later on when someone says to you, well, why are we even doing STEM stuff in libraries? I mean, what business do we have in it? So our good friend, Mr. Ben Franklin, was setting up the Philadelphia Library Company, which would later go on to become the Philadelphia Free Library. Uh, and of course, the very first thing that he orders from Europe are books. Then the second shipment of stuff that he orders is the most cutting edge high-tech science equipment of the day. And it was required of library members that they had to go out and demo and teach the public about what was happening in science. So it's something that's kind of been in American public library DNA from before they were actually American public libraries. So keep that in mind as we're going along. All right, so I'm gonna give you kind of an overview of what's going on here in Colorado. So this is sort of the outline of where we're going and sorry that the translation from Google Slides to WebEx has like made my uh, text a little awkward there, but it's fine. Uh, so kind of the big, these are the big picture things we're gonna hit and I'm gonna give you examples of each of them. Um, so this is sort of what I'm seeing trending. If you guys have other things that you wanna add to this, feel free to chime in. Um, so we're gonna do a poll quick to, uh, why don't you tell me before we get going, what things your library's offering that are high tech and what things they're offering that are kind of low tech? Um, Cause the major trends that I'm seeing are um, using Maker to teach STEM skills, facing things with um, nature and outdoor education, having new exciting circulating things um, that are either teaching science or giving people some access to things they wouldn't have otherwise, doing programming that is for either ages that maybe aren't normally included in STEM programming or doing things that are for everybody. Um, and then I'm calling this next section citizen science both in sort of the formalized way but also in sort of a 
engaging community way. So I'm going to move on, but feel free to answer this poll as we go and we'll um, check back in on that. So um, Maker is sort of where my heart is. So that's sort of where my um, most of my expertise is. So for people who maybe aren't familiar, and if you are, you're all expert users, sorry, I'm going to do it. Um, Maker is just the phenomenon of encouraging people to do either DIY or tech activities and basically using their own hands and their own skills to make something, regardless of what that thing is. Now, <clears throat> traditionally, I think people think of 3D printing and coding, which I have in instances up here because this is uh, going from top to bottom, left to right. Well, I guess left to right, top to bottom. Uh, in our upper uh, left-hand corner, we have the Anything Public Library. Um, in the middle, this is from the Denver Public Library. The furthest on the right is Denver. Um, the bottom left is the Arapahoe Public Library. The middle is Pueblo. And then the right bottom corner is the Pikes Peak Library District um, down in Colorado Springs. So again, you got this wide variety of stuff. So yes, there's 3D printing. Yes, there's coding, playing with circuits. But there's also things like you know, doing audio recording, doing hands-on crafts, tying things back into um, either events in your, that are happening in your library, things ha going on in your collections, things going on with school, that kind of a thing, relatively straightforward. Um, but I think people are sometimes intimidated by Maker because they either feel like they're not creative or that they are like not a coder or not a tech person. But you absolutely don't have to be in order to do maker stuff. Um, and I could talk about this all day long. So I'm going to move on just so that I don't waste all of our time with me standing on my soapbox. Um, so the other kind of big trend I'm seeing, particularly here in Colorado, um, is using nature to teach people about science. Um, I think that this is also it's because it's really accessible and it's really easy for people to understand how it applies to their own life, um, particularly with children, but I think it goes for everybody. Um, so some examples, uh, the top upper left is the Pine River Library, which is um, in Bayfield, Colorado, so just outside of Durango, or for anybody who's not from Colorado, the way far western side of the state. Uh, what they did is they're, they built a new library, and their library is situated directly next to a trailer park. And so they use some of the space to create a, a community garden and to build a super cool, like, geodesic dome greenhouse. Um, and some of the kids that lived in the trailer park came over because they had never actually seen food grown before. So it's this really great way for the library to engage with their community and with their, um, their folks there. Um, the basalt library is circulating well they're not circulating they have a seed bank um i know there are some states where people have run afoul of their uh department of agriculture having seed libraries um generally the way that you can sort of um circumvent rules about guaranteeing things are what they say they are is to have more of like a seed swap or a seed exchange um, basalt is actually like they have a catalog record. They actually follow up with people, make sure they turn seeds back in. Um, but you don't necessarily have to get that involved in your library. Um, in the upper right, this picture is kind of small, but the Mancos Library um, actually backs up to a really awesome um, park. So they do after school outdoor learning all year round. Um, where they use things that are happening in the park, things that are going on in nature to teach kids about um, various natural phenomena. Uh, the bottom left corner is, uh, the, again, in the Bayfield Library, they installed a beehive, but what they did is they also did a, a streaming webcast where people could watch the bees all the time, um, because just for safety and convenience, they put their beehive well out of the way of the public, but people were really curious about it. Um, and then my other two pictures are from the Anythink libraries, um, and I think it's really fun. They also do a embryology program every spring, so where they're hatching either um, chicks or ducks, and then they um, kids learn about what it's like to see a 
an egg hatch, but also sort of like what it looks like for the chicken to grow from like being a little awkward thing to being super cute and fluffy to again, going back to um, being like awkward teenage chicken. Uh, and then I should note, all those chickens go end up in happy homes afterwards. They're not like, they don't have library chicken dinner <laughs> at the end of the embryology program. Um, so the other thing that I've seen a lot of, and I think this is a thing that people are really curious about, um, is having either STEM equipment or robotics equipment circulating in libraries. Um, if anyone is curious about how to do that or what records to put in your catalog, feel free to contact me and I can get you connected. Um, so our examples here with the Longmont, which is sort of um, northeast of, well, yeah, northeast of Denver, um, they're circulating telescopes. Um, the Telluride Library is circulating um, outdoor packs for kids. So they're um, a nice sturdy backpack. And then with binoculars, a compass, uh, books about the outdoors, books about animal tracks, animal poop, um, or I'm sorry, identifying scat, um, but all the things that kids would want to know if they're out in the wild. Um, we also have a really cool project going on in um, Loveland, or I'm sorry, again, in Longmont, sorry. Towns that sound the same um, are where they have worked with a local robotics company to design this robot that um, is designed to engage children with autism. So the, they actually involve students in the design of this robot, and they're going through a pilot project now where they're letting people check out robots and code them. And part of the requirement of checking it out is that you have to code the robot to do something, which is a really interesting and really neat thing. Although um, we've learned and shared of some, their legal department got a little uncomfortable with some of those things. So <laughs> we streamed it or smoothed it out. Um, but we also have a number of libraries that are circulating robots, particularly robots that would appeal to kids. So um, the Clearview Library District and the Arapahoe Library District are circulating BB-8 um, and other spheros. Um, Arapaho is also circulating Dash and Dot, the Finch robot, um, GPS units, as well as um, mobile hotspots. So they're also a really great resource if you want to sort of see what it looks like um, to circulate some of those things. Everyone that I've talked to has had really minimal loss with these sorts of things. Um, Clearview, I just saw them recently and they were talking about their circulation numbers are incredible. They haven't had any issue with things being lost or borrowed permanently. So it's it's something that maybe um, it's not a huge investment, but I know sometimes there's some resistance in case things don't come back. Um, the other big trend that I've seen is doing all ages programming. So. These two examples are from Anythink. They have a basically like littlest makers where they do STEM programming for kids zero to three. So sometimes that can be as simple as building blocks and you're learning about, um, I mean, the very basics for small children about how stable can you make a, how tall can you make a tower? What size base does it need to be to stand up? Um, I think the middle picture they were learning about spells um, and they had sort of a, you could, they talked about cells are these tiny microscopic things that make up everything. Like let's connect the dots. And again, just using a paper plate with holes punched in it and some yarn, but really simple. Um, and the one kind of point I wanna make, I think we do a really good job of engaging our senior patrons when it comes to technology and teaching about computers and teaching about, um, you know, how to get an email address, how to use an iPad, how to use e-readers. I think we do a really good job of that, but I wanna encourage all of you to consider doing some of your more um, other STEM hands-on things in a way that could include seniors. So the, the last thing that I think has been happening quite a lot is um, this move towards citizen science. So if anybody doesn't know, there are a lot of actual science researchers who are wanting input and data from regular people. Uh, some of this is done like through the cloud and you can connect devices and get, compare your data to other things that are happening all over the world. Sometimes it's just reporting on the weather. 
Um, but I think we can expand this concept to also looking at who are the scientists, regardless of whether or not they take that label for themselves in your community that you could tap into. So for instance, um, this photo on the left is from Mesa County, um, which is again, the Western side of Colorado, um, where they partnered with their local university to do regular demonstrations with the science faculty there um, for kids. They also made it really clear to the university that they wanted ways to talk to um, children of a variety of economic and um, racial backgrounds about careers in science. So being really intentional about having those types of conversations. Um, the middle is from the Broomfield Library. Um, they basically have community experts who come in and volunteer. I think this is, uh, they went outside the library and did the um, Mentos and Diet Coke explosions, which while messy, is always a crowd pleaser. Um, and then both the Denver Public Library and the Boulder Public Library are doing a program called Coder Dojo, where they take people who are computer scientists, programmers, web developers in the community, and then they have them working with children. Um, usually the project, it's, it's sort of an ongoing multi-week thing, often done over the summer. Um, I think Denver has expanded it to be year round just because of how many people were interested. Um, but usually they give them very practical projects to do. So like building a website, um, building a video game, those sorts of things so that it's really easily applicable. And then kids are engaging with someone who's a professional who's actually doing this in the field. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. So I am going to go ahead and we're gonna start talking about what's going on in your library. Um, I know you guys have responded to the polls but I think we're gonna switch it over so that you guys can start talking with us. If you have your microphone, we'll use it. If not, we'll do your do it in chat. But let's talk about what's going on with you all. And I have universally unmuted everybody, so if anyone wants to stay muted, you're going to have to remute yourself. <laughs> so has anything worked really well or really terribly? It's totally okay to talk about what didn't work really well, <laughs> and we can make it better. Because I can tell you about some things that went really badly for me, if that is helpful. I can I can take the plunge. Um, That's like a good way to start. <laughs> okay. So, I'm a person who makes up a lot of really great ideas. Um, and I always have these visions that everything is going to go splendidly and perfectly and... Um, with no tech issues, <laughs> which is generally not the way to be. Um, so I was doing a program with a group of teachers um, and I made the mistake of assuming that they were all very close to a big metro area so they had the same kind of uh, resources. Uh, so I was like all set, I brought like all my robots, I brought all my coding stuff, I had um, the like Google Cardboard VR viewers, and I was all ready and I was telling them about all this stuff and I was telling them how it would work and showing them how to do it. And at the end, everyone looked at me and said, yeah, our budget to buy stuff this year is like $30. So what of this could we actually afford? And I was like, oh no, because I totally hadn't thought about it at all. Um, so I'm looking at the chat. Mary has a flop that she fixed. Uh, Mary says they did an adult maker program and they hid it in a meeting room. I've definitely been the um, victim of that before. And then they moved it to the library entrance and just grabbed people as they came in. That is a really good way, especially when you're trying to get new audiences that you're not used to working with because they're not used to working with you either. Um, and I also see that uh, Lisa says she does more crafty maker spaces, so more of the, the low tech stuff. Um, which is great, and yeah, when you have that $30 budget, that's the way to go. So they made paper tissue flowers, they did origami. Um, then I see Dawn is awesome. You guys can talk too, you don't just have to type. Uh, <laughs> Dawn says that they did STEM and STEAM kits that are circulating across the system uh, with little bits, squishy circuits, makey makeys, um, and then lower tech maker stuff. That's awesome, we love the kit idea. And Don, I'm really curious, are you letting patrons check them out or are they just going to different libraries in your system? Just libraries, okay. 
So then the libraries can use them for their own programming. Cool. We have something similar um, where we have like um, like a fossil kit where it's basically like a program in a box. Uh, and I know lots of other state libraries are looking at those types of things. So even if maybe your library doesn't have the ability to do that, nag at your state library and maybe they can get it for you. Right. <laughs> Um, and, and that's a good opportunity for us to mention at SSI, we did just get a large NASA grant where we're mm -hmm. going to be developing those kinds of kits. Obviously, we won't be able to send them to every last person that wants them, but what we can do um, is share with you some of the uh, formative evaluation results and tell you what's in them so that you know what uh, cheap or free, if you're just finding stuff in the drawer, <laughs> stuff that you can do with your patrons from those kits. Absolutely. Um, the other thing that I've seen, um, at, I'm not going to name which library, um, but a library here in Colorado where they spent um, a pretty significant amount of money on a really nice 3D printer and no one was using it and they were really confused and really concerned, but it's because they had stuck it like way in the back of the library in this room that you had to like, it wasn't open all the time and you had to get a good person. Um, so I said, well, why don't you just put it out on the circulation desk for a week or two and just see what happens. And then suddenly everybody wanted to know about it and wanted to um, start learning how to do 3D modeling. So, yeah, I've heard that happen a lot. And the other thing I've heard happen is people get, you know, they get their thousand dollar stipend for some exhibit or a company donates them a 3D printer and then they're just not comfortable using it um, or having their patrons use it because it's really expensive to let people pick their tchotchke they want to print and then it's going all day and that's a lot of supplies. Um, what we've recommended some local libraries have done and they've had great success with it is just because you have a 3D printer doesn't mean you have to take requests from people to use it. You can use it in your programming too. So if you're doing, and the dinosaur bones is a great, is a great example, if you want to do a dinosaur activity and you don't have a museum, you can borrow dinosaur bones from. There are websites where you can just download the 3D scans and print them mm -hmm. yourself and use those items for your programming uh, rather than having to beg, borrow, and steal <laughs> to get the actual artifact. And so I know there are a lot of people who are doing these kind of like hands-on science activities just with whatever is handy. I'm going to grab uh, the URL for this, and I'm sorry, I'm typing and it's making my computer shake. Um, <laughs> We have a, a local nonprofit called um, Research Area for Teachers, um, and they are our raft. There's one in um, the Bay Area as well, um, but I'm going to pull up. They have a lot of, if you're in the metro area, it's super fun to visit. They have all kinds of cool stuff. Um, but they also do these really great um, projects where it's basically like how do you teach some of these activities with basically stuff that would be thrown away. All right, here we go. I'm going to put this in the chat, um, but it's really nice because, you know, the most recent one that I did that apparently I, it was designed for children, I think six to 12 and I struggled, <laughs> uh, but it was like building the uh, Da Vinci bridge, but with um, painters. And you were learning about like not only how does an arch work, but also like how you could build things without um, glue or nails or something like that. Uh, oh, and John, that's a really cool idea about Raspberry Pis with Minecraft. That's also really nice. I personally, um, there's uh, if you're doing Raspberry Pi for sort of like the tween set and maybe even a little bit younger. Um, there's an operating system called Kano, K-A-N-O, um, where you can buy a kit from them or you can just download their instructions and their operating system for free, um, which is super nice. And it's a very easy and it's very, um, it's a really visual interface. So it's good for either small people or people who are sort of maybe uncomfortable with technology or even really like uncomfortable with like reading technology instructions. So. That's the hardest part. I know. <laughs> well, with, for me, it was the Raspberry Pi. Oh, I will write it down. Yeah, I'll grab it. Their website, too. Okay, no. Um, 
uh, that was the hardest thing for me when I started doing my Raspberry Pi was getting the Wi-Fi to work, <laughs> like getting my Wi-Fi uh, <laughs> dongle set up. I think that took longer than anything else. Okay. All right. Do we want to perhaps move on to the next conversation bit? Yeah. Good. Okay. So I mentioned earlier, you know, that idea of finding those people in your community who are like the science expert. Um, but are there things in your community that maybe make you unique, make you different, where you can maybe tap into your resources? So. Um, like things I've seen are 4-H, um, you know, those people who are near the state park could tap into their um, parks folks. Is there anything else maybe that you guys can think of that you have going on in your community? You guys are quiet. <laughs> Does anybody have a, oh, community colleges industry, cool. Um, in Colorado, we're really lucky that there's just like a ton of tech startups. Um, so I've heard libraries partnering with coders, with people who are wanting to um, do rapid prototyping and testing on some new product they're developing. And, and even going beyond the actual, you know, educational providers, I was just at a conference last week and I was mentioning um, that we sometimes have scientists come to libraries and, and talk about the great work they're doing and all of these, like, satellite developers, people doing stuff for the military, they're like, oh, we could do that. Well, we're not selling anything, but we want people to see how amazing we are, right? It's name recognition. So mm -hmm. if you've got some sort of tech company of any sort nearby, they don't have to be educators. They love to come and talk about their stuff. And Don, am I am I correct in assuming that DNR is your Department of Natural Resources? Not do not resuscitate, because that would be strange. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a partnership going with at the state level with our state uh, Department of Natural Resources, where we're getting um, state parks passes that people can check out from the libraries, and that has been really successful. We just started a pilot and it's getting ready to launch statewide. We're really excited about it. Um, da, da, da. So Sarah, if you're looking to get in with maybe your um, mechanics people, I wonder if maybe there's also like um, a guild or a union that you could connect with. And then maybe if you're, um, if you're going, um, you can connect with like everybody all at once with you know just the one phone call or visit rather than having to contact every space in town. Um, has anybody had any good luck with like hands-on mechanical people? I think that's a really great resource too. Um, the other way you could go about it is if you have a, um, a strong workforce development in your area. I know that kind of varies from place to place, but maybe your workforce people could also help. Because um, if you were doing a programming sort of in the um, let's get kids learning how to do hands-on skills, that might be something they could help you out with and maybe help offset some of the costs. But I think that's a really cool idea. Is anybody that's with us like a small and rural um, community? Maybe not a lot into the real years. Yeah, Sarah, I think tapping into somebody that's local that already has that, I would maybe ask your volunteers or your library board to see if anybody knows anybody who's doing that. That might be an easy way to go too. Mm -hmm. You, know, you can also, I, I know not every library does this, but if you have any sort of annual events, these are the type of people to invite to those events. Um, and then you can have the conversations there as well once they see what it is you're already doing. Mm -hmm. Do you want to move on to the next topic? Yeah, let's go ahead. All right. 
All right, so this is a, a different version of the above question. We confused ourselves figuring that out the other day. <laughs> but I wanted to know, um, what's the wrapper for your STEM programming? So I know a lot of the people that wanted to participate in this webinar, but that are viewing it online later, they've actually not done any STEM programming before. And what they want to know is what successful programs have done to take existing things. You know, maybe they've just got the box of blocks sitting out or the bin of dinosaurs for the toddlers. They want to know what wrapper you put around those existing things uh, to, to make the first steps toward doing STEM activities. And like I said, especially the stuff that's just already sitting there because that's the easiest. <laughs> and Peggy, so a thought that I had if um, people are telling you that you're too far away um, is to do um, an online event. Um, and it sounds really complicated, but it really doesn't have to be. If you have um, a laptop, a projector, and a relatively quiet place to be, um, I've done, I actually just had a Google Hangout yesterday with an author from England um, with a group full of, um, I think it was like 40 preschoolers. Um, they also liked it where, so I put the camera on them so they could kind of see themselves. And we had a projector going so that he was a big picture. Um, and then he could hear them, they could hear, well, everybody could hear each other and they could ask him questions. So that's one kind of way to do. Oh, and I like your idea, Don. Blocks, Legos. And yeah, for the school library, I think having, um, Having, you, you guys can do a lot of those, um, I guess what we in the public library world call passive programming, where it's the self-directed kind of things um, that you can tie back to your curriculum and things that are going on. Abigail, that's amazing. <laughs> cool. Sarah, that's a, that's a really good idea, and it's something that I've heard people say, you know, you can internally say that you're doing STEM programming when you're doing your annual reports, talk about the STEM, uh, but if you use those terms, you're absolutely right. It does drive certain crowds away. So, yeah, using words like clubs or walk-in events or even hands-on activities, uh, things like that, uh, it do really make sure that you're not scaring people away with the terminology. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, and Peggy, uh, so instead of using Skype, I use Google Hangouts. Um, mostly because it's free and really easy. Ooh, Sarah, I like the idea of just a microscope to kind of hang out and check out. Yeah, it's a great idea. Okay, does anybody else have anything they want to share about kind of cool things you're doing to get people going? Otherwise, I'm going to move along. Going to uh, open a poll real quick. I think I was supposed to open for the last question. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the question is, do you partner with or collaborate with any other STEM institutions? So I want to know, if you worked with somebody, who are you working with? And I guess we'll have like 20 seconds to go. Or no, wait, five minutes. So yeah, feel free to respond to that one. Um, and if you want to pop in with the microphone or just type in the chat, if these things were successful, um, you know, not every not every partnership is is a valuable one, unfortunately, when it comes to interacting with the public. And it's good to know how you can change your approach to still utilize those organizations. And this is maybe not directly related to STEM, but just in general. I've noticed a trend for public libraries in particular um, to you go and ask someone to do a program for you or you ask them to be a partner with you and um, you don't you guys sell yourself short. So talking about what right. what you guys have available, what are they going to get from working with you? Because it's really unique and really interesting. Um, 
and like Mary with your female engineer group, they some of these groups have outreach goals that they have to meet and, and saying, hey, we have this many people that come to the library on a monthly, um, weekly, yearly basis, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Astronomy Clubs are good, Engineers Without Borders, um, if you guys were on the webinar last month, uh, Solar System Ambassadors, and again, those are people that they love to come and do these public things, but what's even better is if you can, like, like Ashley is saying, do something in tandem with that, do a related story time that morning, and then have the, the quote, professional come in. You guys are professionals, too, obviously. <laughs> someone else saying that they steer away from STEM. You know, I, I don't think that's problematic at all. As long as you know that that's your intent, um, the goal is to get people to show up. <laughs> okay, cool. And it looks like in our poll, um, we've got some zoos, aquariums, more four-year colleges and community colleges. I would really encourage you guys to tap those community colleges, especially when you're talking about volunteers. Uh, students will come in once a week or once a month to help you with something. Um, community colleges tend to, um, it's not what they used to be, right? They do tend to attract um, older students as well who are really eager uh, to participate in the community. Fun, clever names, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so has anyone has anyone noticed that? Do you feel like parents show up more if they see that the content is educational, or do they just look for that clever name? Is there a middle ground? <laughs> I know what I've seen is if there's not a program description, like on your website, um, if it just says STEM Club Thursday, 4 o'clock, but if it says, this week we're going to build bridges or whatever it is, I feel like people will, who maybe aren't regulars come more exciting. And working with 4-H, super awesome idea. I think that's an excellent plan. Um, partnering with the Children's Museum. Um, da, da, da. Has anybody gotten bought museum passes for people like to check out that maybe they can't afford? Maker Monday, Tinker Tuesday. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> I like it. And um, it's worth noting that with those pass programs where you guys purchase or get donated a uh, museum pass, the museums are very um, very likely to just donate those to you because they do have goals themselves of reaching um, certain underserved and underrepresented audiences. So if you're in a district where you can say, you know, 80% of people that visit us XYZ and you can give that information to the museum, they, they will give you passes because then they can report those statistics as well. Absolutely. And they're looking for ways to get either low income or underrepresented populations in the door. Absolutely. And state parks, the zoo, those are also aquariums. Um, those are really great resources. And um, Abigail, so if you're from uh, CU, have you seen the uh, 3D modeling that the CU Museum has put out? Those are really cool. <laughs> And Peggy, I think that's a really great point to make things that are easily people could do on their own. So doing things that are like web-based, like Tinkercad, where they don't have to, ha or um, like open source digital programs where they don't have to have a um, something, you know, an expensive piece of equipment to do things. It's really helpful. And if you can hand out like even just a half a page of information that tells them how to easily do it or where to find the stuff. Um, that's very helpful, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, here's another question I have for you all that I didn't think to formally put in. Um, is anybody using STEM in uh, their upcoming summer reading program for this summer? Because I know the national theme is um, health, wellness, and fitness know what you guys are doing.
I'm just assuming you're all typing furiously. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm waiting on. I'm like, yes. <laughs> You know, and with the, I, I know uh, the Greeley Library is up north of us. Um, some of their summer reading activities that they're doing um, are actually around cooking. So they're doing uh, healthy cooking classes. Um, again, they're not necessarily framing it that way. It's come make burritos, right? And then they have healthy ingredients, and they're able to tie that in with the summer reading, uh, talk about the digestive system and different body systems as well. They're pretty excited uh, to do uh, a health-based STEM activity. A race car driver, Sarah, oh, that is a gosh. cool idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to come to your library. That's right. Awesome. Where are you? <laughs> what a neat idea. I bet Sarah's in Indiana. <laughs> I would guess. <laughs> Middle of nowhere in Nebraska, really. Hey, awesome. we're close to Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, we can just come on down. Yeah, scratch coding, Minecraft, that's great. Oh, you've got your own. Oh, that's so amazing. Peggy says that she's got her own little Minecraft world that's just for her library patrons to build in. That is amazing. And setting up your own server for Minecraft is not nearly as complicated as it sounds. And having that kind of digital space that the kids can all own is super cool. Um, healthy Citizens Backpack, that's a super rad idea. Um, the other uh, angle that I've heard is um, buying um, like uh, seed packets, like just a handful, and in your small story times, like doing um, stories on like growing and gardening and nature, and then sending the kids home with like a little seed in a either a wet paper towel or just a little, um, you know, paper cup with a little bit of soil. Yeah, these are all, these are all great ideas, and and if you guys are willing to share, we can post these things on our community site so that other people who maybe don't have the time to devote to developing these programs can just use the great stuff that you've already done. Um, really helpful uh, for smaller, uh, less well-funded libraries. So, do you guys have any questions for any of us? Through Minecraft EDU. Awesome. Well, if nobody else has any more questions, um, maybe we can get our, uh, <laughs> you guys can furiously type now that I've threatened to close the window. Um, we can just give our last minute um, thoughts. Ashley, if you have anything that you want to say uber to all of this? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think no one should be intimidated about STEM or having to be yourself an amazing scientist or engineer. Um, I think there's accessible points for everyone. And I think that um, knowing what's going on in your community, knowing kind of what people are interested in, that's kind of the best way to start, even if it's something simple like playing Minecraft or building something with Play-Doh or Legos. I think that's awesome. Um, and then the only other thing that I will say is you don't have to do these programs forever. You can do something and try it and see how it goes and like reflect, change it up a little bit and do something different. So um, just because you might be starting up a maker club or a robotics club or whatever it is, um, you can feel free to adapt and grow and change. Um, I think that's all part of the process. 
Absolutely. And the only thing I wanted to add is, you know, if, if people are donating you this great high tech stuff and you've never done it before, great, do that. You've got the equipment. If you want to get started, you don't have to start high tech. It's totally okay uh, to do, you know, outdoor activity backpacks, to do Play-Doh, to do the Legos. That's fine. And it's a really good way to kind of change the culture of your library and the patrons that are participating in your programs. If you ease them into it, um, there's less of a chance that when you do start to do the fancier things, there's not going to be as much a drop off of people scared of it because they already trust you to provide them with quality programming and resources. Um, so, you know, any way you want to start is absolutely fine. And don't be afraid to ask for help, uh, be that from any of us, from your local community, from volunteers at the community colleges. People like this kind of stuff and they will show up and help you. Absolutely. And really, even if, you're, if your goal is to engage with small people, you probably don't even want to bother with doing anything that's tech-based. Yeah. Small people break things, it's not weird. <laughs> yeah, and they have little hands, and yeah. so, like, you know, wiring electronics, not an excellent plan. <laughs> Kellyanne, did you want to add an Uber thought? <laughs> I just want to say stay tuned to StarNet and, and keep uh, looking, opening up those new newsletters so that we are keeping you in touch with the different sorts of resources that we have so that, uh, so that we can all work together to help share these ideas and um, make the most of the trails that have been blazed already. Absolutely. And those of you who have been soldiering through our, our terrible website situation right now, uh, we are getting our new and improved website and our STEM resource clearinghouse where you can find some of these more paper activities. Um, we'll all be ready around mid-June. Um, so we will announce that in the newsletter. So please, like Kellyanne said, keep your eye on that so we can let you know when everything is amazing and beautiful. <laughs> Uh, so if no one has any further questions or feedback, um, we can go ahead and end the webinar. You will get a survey popping up when you try to close the window. Uh, please do fill out that survey if you have any suggestions for future webinars. Uh, please do uh, write those in there. Um, someone says they connected late. How do they get the newsletter? Uh, email me and I will add you to those items. There's my email address. Um, and if there are no further questions, I will go ahead and stop the recording. We'll keep it open for just a few more minutes here in case anyone is furiously writing, but the recording is ending now.